Hello, and welcome back to the Newberry Report. I am Carrie Caston, and joining me, as always, is Carolyn Burns. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, I am Carolyn. And we are excited this week because this is the only part of the podcast where we won't be depressed. So enjoy it. Put a little chocolate in your mouth. Ugh, go take a big old glass of bourbon right now. Maybe sit in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Newberry Report, your favorite podcast, hopefully, where every two weeks we discuss a book that won the Newberry Medal. Today, we'll be discussing the winner in 1974, Slave Dancer by Paula Fox. So we were remiss two weeks ago and not mentioning that, of course, Julie of the Wolves is a dead dog story. We're sorry for not bringing that up at the time. There was just so much to talk about. And I know we said that we definitively covered the topic uh, of Julie of the Wolves, but we clearly missed that. And we're sorry. Thank you, everyone, for pointing that out to us. You were so right. Um, but this week, we have for you, ready for it, The Slave Dancer by Paula Fox. Now, normally we start off with, did you like it? Did you not like it? I think we can already gauge from the topic that it's going to be a downer. Um, Let's jump straight to title, because I had a lot of problems with this title. It's uh, misleading. It's so misleading. They're almost using dancer in the opposite way that you would anticipate them using it. It's almost like the dancer and the dancee, as if dancing is something that can be forced upon someone, which you could argue is the proper way of describing this, because that is literally his job, is to force the an environment and playing music f- so that dancing must occur, occur he calls he occur. says he danced them yes um in the book so what did he dance of course take a guess slaves slaves so this is a book <laughs> about a young man um about jesse who is kidnapped and uh brought aboard a slave ship not as a slave but to help get slaves they're gonna go to africa he lives in um new orleans Mm -hmm. they're going from new orleans to presumably somewhere on the um west coast of africa we don't get an exact landing location correct um but we imagine it's a straight line (laughs) as much as possible um and then back, he's told it'll be a four-week journey. Four month. Oh, four month. Oh, then it probably was right. So he's kidnapped, brought him about this this slave gathering ship in a time in the in eighteen forty, after which nearly every country had outlawed um the importation of new slaves. Slavery itself had not been outlawed, but the importation of new slaves from mm-hmm. other countries had been outlawed. Um and it doesn't go well. We find out from page one, not even page one, before... Do you have this in your book? Oh, I we have do. The, we have Can we same, talk about this? We have the same book. We do. Um, uh, I felt very uh, strongly about this. There's there's a... The history. The history page. Which provides very little history. <laughs> so, so there's a... Before the novel begins, there's a single page that just says history. And it's just a fact a name list of the crew of this ship. Yeah, it looks like a cast list. <laughs> yes, ship. The moonlight. <laughs> Officers. Captain Cawthorn, the master. Nicholas Spark, not Nicholas Sparks, which I was very confused about. I was so excited for Nicholas Sparks to be in this book. And turns out it's just a coincidence of name. A singular spark. Man. So then we get a list of the crew, we get a list of the cargo, which is 98 slaves whose true names were remembered only by their families, except for the young boy, Ross. And then, shipwrecked in the Gulf of Mexico, June 3rd, 1840. With two survivors. So the whole time, it didn't occur to me that Ross would be the other survivor, I, the whole time I was like, who's going to, who is it? Who's going to be like, presumably it is our hero, our Jesse, who for the first time in um, this series of podcasts, we have a first person narrative. Yeah. P-O-V. P-O-V. I, 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 I. I. Feels so good. It feels real nice. But uh, spoiler alert, pre, pre pre-novel spoiler alert, like this uh, it left very little plot to be discovered as it happened, but I, I think that in this book in particular, it's not so much a series of events. It's about how it is, uh, how it's filtered through the mindset of this specific boy. We have our beautiful first-person narrative, and then through the ship 
mates and other crew members. You know, you have the character of Ross who comes out towards the end and you you never really get a feel for who he is. There's a there's language barrier. There's a cultural barrier. You know, he's there and you sort there's of There's a see, status barrier, too. There is, yeah. Like, he still understands that... that uh, so it's a slave ship where um, there's a cargo, a tiny cargo hold um, into which they've placed everyone that they've um, kidnapped or have been, have bought. I want to say they, they fit... A hundred slaves in a place where at the beginning of the book they say... Uh, or 98, yeah. A hundred slaves in a spot where one of the first... During the initial tour of the boat, uh, Jesse comments that no more than 12 will fit in there. Yeah. 12. <sighs> I don't know. There was There was enough going on that still piqued my interest because it was not... It didn't matter what the plot was. It was about how the characters were influencing each other and how this young child's view of the world was being influenced by this horrific situation he had been forced into. It, well, I, I don't even know if his view of the world was changed that much because he came in with this. I don't want to call him self-righteous because he's on the right side. <laughs> So a well, self-righteous <laughs> kid doesn't want slavery. Yeah, thinks it's a bad idea. Points out to the people on his ship that every country in the surrounding area has outlawed this practice and equally agrees it's egregious. But none of the other people seem to care. So there's a, there's a conversation he has with one of the other crew members, Ned. He says, uh, but you're a slaver, ain't you, Ned? And he goes, mm, my heart's not in it, he said flatly. Ugh, I wrote that down too. I wondered about his heart, imagining it to be something like one of the raisins Curry used to slip into the duff. Like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yeah, it's... Oh, Jesus Christ, all the feels in this book. Yeah, it had... <laughs> So it's so interesting because they seem to have two modes, right? One is this like very specific morality. So um, the captain is explaining why he's in the slave trade business at all mm. at, to Jesse. And he says, um, so he's talking about England, who has outlawed slavery and the slave trade in, its, in their own country. And he's saying they have different laws than us. They've entirely stopped the slave trade in their own country, the worst for them, and would like us to copy them in their folly. Why, the trade is the best trade there is. Black gold, we call it. Still, there's one way they help us. The native chiefs are so greedy for our trade goods, they sell their people cheaper than they ever did to tempt us to run the British blockade. So we profit despite the damned Englishmen. It's just business. It's just business. And you sort of believe that for a long time. And t like, this is just how Captain Hawthorne makes his money. And he mm -hmm. doesn't, it's almost not amoral because it's impossible for this to be amoral, but it's the, the, he doesn't seem to hate the African people. He just seems to think it's a very profitable opportunity. Mm hmm. But then the ball that they have at the end, so they have this like weird sadistic um, gala <laughs> at the end where they have these, um, the Africans that have been in the, we, I think we hear they're Ashanti at some point, mm -hmm. or they, they speculate that they may be Ashanti, um, uh, who probably don't have clothes from, from what we hear. They, they're clothed on the cover of the book, uh, barely, but we're told that they're naked at some point. So most of them are naked and few have scraps of, of clothing a like that yeah. they managed to, to keep on their bodies during the, the trade-off. Yeah, so they've been primarily exposed for the, the majority of this journey. And then this like sick, twisted event that the captain throws at the end is the, he dresses them all up in fine gowns and suits and has a ball just like really hit like there is there's almost no bounds to the disrespect <laughs> that they have for these people yeah This is a, sort of a tangent, but what I'm enjoying most about this podcast is the way that I'm re-examining literary terms that were sort of shoved down my throat as a <laughs> child, and um, and foreshadowing in particular, I've I've really garnered a new appreciation for, because it isn't just 
it isn't just a warning device, but it's also a resonating device, a sort of retrospective resonating device, which I have been really digging in a lot of the books that we've been reading. But this one in a sort of really extremely awful example, when they're dressing them up for the ball, Mm -hmm. it harkens back to the very first woman that they throw overboard. And they said they throw her up on the deck like as if she were a doll. Mm. And then they were dressing these people up as if they're dolls later. So many, so many moments in this book. I, it's, this is it's a difficult book to read. Mm-hmm. I think we both agreed with that. That just physically getting through it yeah. is, is is trying on the the main the mind and the body. Um, but there were so many moments of literal like oh, that I had when something that was was just like this small moment comes back later in the book that I, it was just a connection I didn't see foresee happening or yeah. a connection that you didn't understand you know an obvious one is towards the end of the novel where he's trying to uh, where the ship is sinking and him and Roz have to uh, basically cling for their lives to this piece of the mast and doggy paddle back to shore who knows how many miles out in the middle of a storm in the middle of the night after being being emaciated for four months uh and he starts thinking uh i wonder what gave me the courage to do that and it's uh it's the memory of his own father's death and how he used to wake up in the middle of the night saying oh swim that propelled him forward and it's such an it's like in retrospect such an obvious connection but at the time you know we had we had gotten that anecdote about his father's death so early on that when it finally came back literally in the last Mm -hmm. novel the last uh chapter of the novel i was like oh yes boy swim (laughs) it reminded me of um have you read the harry potter books (sighs) yes it reminded me of the in the third Harry Potter book where um, Harry thinks that his father sends his Patronus to rescue him mm-hmm. and he waits and he waits and then he realizes, have I brought this up on this podcast? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> like, I no, I just know exactly what you're I talking had a about. deja vu moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, which is sort of what we're talking about. So it's sort of apropos that I'm having a deja, mo- Dave, deja vu moment. But, a Dave Chappelle moment. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, that man is, is too Ugh. brilliant for me, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, he, she has this, uh, he thinks, Harry thinks that his father is saving him, but really it's himself that comes and saves him. And it sort of felt like the same, like he thought he was saving, it's sort of the same, but backwards. He thought he was trying to save his father, but in reality, he was calling towards his future to save himself. I thought I thought it was really interesting. They, they sort of spoke a lot about um, this sort of like father figure character that Jesse's lacking. You know, you you learn early on that he doesn't have a father. And in some ways you start to see him almost treating Pervious uh, in that light. You know, he says he doesn't necessarily like him, but he respects him and he wants to listen to him and he finds himself drawn to him for no particular reason. It felt like a very like familial connection that they had where it's like, I might not always like you, but I love you. You know, that sort of relationship that they had. Um, that then he meets the old man at the end. They find at the at the at the very end after they've been shipwrecked, he and Ross find this old man who takes them in. He sort of fattens them up. He gives them direction. He sets them on their feet again, uh, and on their way out. Uh, so um, Jesse says, "I wanted him to touch my head as he had Ross's, but his arms remained unmoving at his sides. I looked in his face. He didn't smile." The distance between us lengthened even as I stood there listening to his breathing, aware of a powerful emotion, gratitude mixed with disappointment. I thought of Purvis. Uh, Go on now, he said. I stepped out of the hut. Daniel had saved my life. I couldn't expect more than that. I think that that was outside of the slavery. (laughs) That was one of the saddest interactions, I think, of the novel was they meet this old man, he takes them in, he feeds them, he fattens them up, and they live with him for weeks. It takes him seven days before he learns his name. Like, it's just, it was a very odd relationship that he had that I think for someone who who obviously at that point had just been jonesing so much to have a father figure in his life to still not be able to find that. Like, it was just, it was like, throwing salt on the wound for me. Yeah. I found the epilogue really fascinating because it's sort of like his life has changed for the better. Like he resolves to... He doesn't actively work against slavery, but he insists on finding a career for himself that um, is untouched by the trade. Mm -hmm. And um, 
this is sort of a joke, so sorry that the, <laughs> I'm injecting some levity into this, but I thought it was really frustrating that he ends up moving to Rhode Island. Like, his mother spends the first chapter, like, railing against Massachusetts, and at least we don't have snow, and at least we're not up in Massachusetts. Rhode Island is really close. That's colder. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Why are you bringing her there? Although, like, I, I can't imagine she wanted to live in New Orleans. I think she was just lying about, like... Because he's sort of saying all these terrible things about New Orleans, and she's like, what? Oh, yeah. On. The epilogue in general, I could have just cut yeah. from the whole book. I was a terrible way to end. Or home and after. I guess it's not called an epilogue, but it sort of feels like We're that. calling it the epilogue. because. Yeah. But did you notice that in... So it's the final chapter mm-hmm. that we're calling the epilogue, but it technically is just part of the novel. The voice changes. Mm. You almost lose this first-person, intimate, sort of childlike very like you were saying intuitive didactic like this this very uh strong voice to just like and then i went here and then yeah. i did this and then i did that and here are the facts and this is it and that's how it ends and i, I didn't need it to be tied up yeah. i liked it the way it was and I, I i think that you know it's great to learn that the, the lessons that he learned on the ship have kept with him his whole life although you could also make the argument that uh ignorance is bliss i don't know maybe that's not the argument i'm trying to make but like he does nothing you know it's yeah. it's it, he has all this information all of this passion now saying that uh he doesn't want to be a part of this but he just agrees to just ignore it basically for the rest of his life he fights in the army but he does i don't know yeah. now i'm not making a point <laughs> no i agree i don't think we learn too much valuable about him mm-hmm um except that he's processed his trauma in this particular way don't go anywhere we'll be right back after this this episode of the newberry report is sponsored by payfully renting your home or spare room can be a great way to earn some extra income but actually getting paid can take months that's where payfully comes in Payfully is a safe and secure way to get paid for your upcoming reservations within 24 hours of them being booked. Payfully deposits directly into your bank account with funds usually available the same day. It works with all the major platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, and others, and they've helped thousands of hosts expand their business or cover unexpected expenses. Visit payfully.co, that's P-A-Y-F-U-L-L-Y dot C-O, for $20 off your first request with code NEWBERRY. That's payfully.co, promo code NEWBERRY, N-E-W-B-E-R-Y. Hello, listeners. Are you a business owner? Your next customer might be listening right now, just like you are. You can let them know who you are by sponsoring this show. Just email us at hello at citizenracecar.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at citizenracecar.com. All right, let's get back to The Slave Dancer. So I had I had two minds about this book. I guess to go back to to like it, not like it is one is that it is really hard, in th- not that this is in this day and age because this was in 1974, so it's hard to speak about the context in which it was created. But um, and arguably ten years after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, um, it's hard as a white person to read a book about slavery because like. Like, for the same reason that I didn't watch The Passion of Christ, I didn't watch 12 Years a Slave, right? Because, like, I have not a visceral understanding, but as close as to visceral understanding of the the awfulness of both events, of the crucifixion of Christ and the slavery of uh, Africans in our country. Um, yes. But, yeah, and, and I have no problem, as, as a Catholic, I have no problem being uh, self-flagellating, right? But there's something about... There's something that's hard to say, what what is the new light you're shedding on this? And what is the action path moving forward? So there's something that's um, that comes up a lot in stories about slavery that's like, what do we do about it? And as a book that maybe is introducing the concept to uh, readers for the first time, I thought that it... It handled it in an, in probably the best way it could have because we didn't have anyone that was sympathetic to slavery, and so if you're gonna if you're introducing the concepts to people, like 
better to have your protagonist, your I, your kid be the one that's like, this is wrong. So that you're most identifying the strongest and easiest with the person that does not agree with this practice. Mm -hmm. But if you had been introduced to the idea before, or if you had some sense of the full weight, which is impossible, but if you had some sense of some sense of the weight of the pain of slavery, I wasn't, I, I felt at times like, what are we getting from this story that's different? But at the same time, so many of those lines, like that line about Ed's heart and, oh, my heart's not really in it, was so relevant to today. <laughs> I actually wrote All Lives Matter at one point. <laughs> um, that's the one you're not supposed to say, All Lives Matter. <laughs> no, I know, but they it was sort of a someone yeah. espousing an All Lives Matter viewpoint. <laughs> but um, so he's talking to Pervious and... Um, Jesse says, you're kidnapping these people. And Pervia says, don't say such things. You know nothing about it. Do you think it's easier for my own people who sailed to Boston 60 years ago from Ireland, locked up in a hold for the whole voyage where they might have died of sickness and suffocation? Uh, Jesse comes back and says, I know nothing about your mother and father. Besides, they were not sold on the block. And, uh, and Pervia says back, the Irish were sold, he cried. Indeed, they were sold. And Jesse says, they are not sold now. That to me really resonated with the argument of Black Lives Matter versus mm. All Lives Matter versus <laughs> whatever hashtag is happening or whatever political movement is happening at the time that this is released of like, it doesn't matter. Not that your past doesn't matter, but you have to take into account your current situation and the current situation of the people that you are interacting with. Mm -hmm. So the reason that slavery is still relevant now is because the lives of people that have descended from this population are still feeling the effects of it. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough that they're no longer enslaved, but are the lo quality of lives that these people can expect on par with the quality of their neighbors. And that this sort of like savant 13 year old <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> intuits and espouses that. Uh, I mean, this kid is this kid is extremely astute and ex extremely intuitive <laughs> all throughout. Mm -hmm. Making observations that, like, I don't even know that I would have made now as a 30-year-old woman <laughs> in this situation is... Um, is a little didactic, right? Like, let's be honest. Like the the car the, um, uh, our author Paula Fox, like clearly is speaking what we should be thinking through this character, but it it still hit me. Yeah. So now we can come to our favorite section. It's my favorite section. The illusion of life. Mm -hmm. This is our section of, of the podcast where we find uh, a moment or a sentence or a phrase from the book that clarifies a worldview or a way of processing the world around our characters. Um, and I sort of didn't, I didn't settle on anything for this book. Did you find one, Carolyn? I did. Um... I think there are probably a lot of different illusions you could pull from this, um, but this one I thought was was interesting, and it mostly because uh, I found it a very I found it interesting that this story is told through the eyes of a kidnap victim. Mm -hmm. It's a story about slavery told from the point of view of a white man, and obviously there are going to inherently be issues with that. Who but has sort of been enslaved in a, in a parallel man in a in a different yeah. in a different obviously not as bad way right. with the promise of release upon coming back home right. hypothetically but it is it is telling that you know mm -hmm. they're they're telling a story about slavery by someone who is who is unwillingly brought into a situation so uh this is about midway through the book uh he's just talking about his life on the ship um and he says i observed the sailors with as little pity as they observed the blacks as for them, I shuddered at the barbarousness of chance which had brought each of them to our holds, although, as I had good reason to know, chance often wore a suit of clothes and sometimes chewed tobacco and carried a pistol. Yeah, I thought that should have been the title. The bar barbaricness? Barbar Barbarousness. Barbarousness, 
whatever adjective for whatever form she tell me chose. if i'm mispronouncing this <laughs> but I, I wrote that down too i felt like that should have been the, t- the title although i imagine that would not have gotten um kids excited about yeah the book but for me that was that was yeah the core um theme of the book yeah it's just that like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't you know a chance has brought everyone to this horrible situation like this boat is a terrible place for everyone involved and ends up literally killing every single person on board other than two and that includes the slaves down in the hold and the captain sitting in his plush uh nice little office with his chickens roaming around all the rum he can drink you know it's it is it's just like the chance of life like you're going to be put in the same situations no matter who you are and i thought it was i just i thought it was interesting yeah the the sort of moment for me that was the most crystallizing about the connection to Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter versus like the ability to empathize with people similarly situated to yourself or sort of equally feeling rejected or outside of the people that are successful in any culture. Because even at the bottom, people are always fighting to not be the bottom. Um there is an, another line by Pervious, who remember is Irish, and um, and uh, Pervious was telling Jesse right that the Irish were slaves too, so it's like almost okay for him to be on this boat because he knows what it's like. Um, and so um, Jesse is asking about what happens to um, a potential slave or an African that they have kidnapped that is not healthy enough to bring along. He is bringing up concern for the people in the hold. Um, and Pervious gets mad at um, Jesse for being so sympathetic. And and um, Jesse realizes, I, I guess I had guessed by now that any interest, much less concern, I showed about the blacks meant to Pervious that I was demeaning his mother and father. It was as though there was a connection in his mind, unknown even to himself, between our living cargo and those Irish folk long dead, the story of their voyage, a lingering and bitter glory in his memory Ugh, mm. like that was so astute yeah <laughs> and i think and i thought that that was so telling about why people feel the need to say all lives matter mm. is that they feel like in some way they matter less mm. if we're talking about black lives matter that they as a white person matter less and that's not what the black lives that's not what feminism is about that's not what black lives matter is about that's not what any of these um cultural movements are about mm-hmm. but equality th- yeah but there are these people that view equality as a zero sum game mm. so that any movement forward by any other group is a movement down for them mm. and that Jesse Bollier <laughs> Jesse Bollier was able to figure that out at 13 in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> what's he gonna do all day but sit around and think you know yeah. <laughs> so what do we want to rate this book oh I feel I feel bad making jokes about this book. I know. <laughs> um, I'm gonna give it. Uh, I'm gonna give it two survivors. <laughs> two out of two survivors. <laughs> Both of them survived. Yeah. I'm gonna give it one awkward sister trying on a dress for a rich person. <laughs> one awkward sister who is has to be a dressmaker's dummy for the evening. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. We made it. Oh, slave Dancer, you were wonderful, and I look forward to no longer be reading you. Yeah. If you have thoughts or feelings about the way, the best ways in which to discuss um, books about slavery in our current era, uh, I think we're even in a different place than we were in the 1970s. Um, let's keep this discussion going. Let's uh, let's figure out how to make this world a gosh darn better place. Um, so that was, in case you again are just tuning in at the end, which is so weird, start tuning in at the beginning. But this is The Slave Dancer by Paula Fox, the 1974 Newbery award-winning book. Join us in two weeks where we'll talk about M.C. Higgins the Great by Virginia Hamilton, the 1975 Newbery award-winning book. As always, thank you, Carolyn Burns, so much for joining me. You're welcome, Carrie. That's it. Thank, thank you, Carrie. No. Okay. I'm good. Maybe next time. <gasps> Bye. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for listening. Join the conversation and tell us what you thought about the book at facebook.com slash Newberry Report. That's N-E-W-B-E-R-Y Report. The Newberry Report is hosted and recorded by me, Carrie Caston, and my co-host is Carolyn Burns. It was co-produced and edited by David Hoffman. It's a production of Race Car Radio. If you're not already subscribed to our show, you can do so on iTunes or Google Play or head to www.racecarradio.com. Race Car Radio is a division of Citizen Race Car. We tell stories.